If I could bottle up the sea breeze, I would take it over to your house and pour a loose through your garden so the hinges on your windows would rust and color like the boats pulled up on the sand for the summer. And your sweet clean clothes would go stiff on the line and there'd be sand in your pockets and nothing on your mind. Oh, 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 oh. But every year it gets a little bit harder to get back to that feeling of a week 15. We jump in the river upstream and let the current carry us to the beginning where the river met the sea again. And all the days were a sun drenched haze while the salt spray crusted on the wind of bay. Oh, oh, oh. You should be living like we did that summer. I want to live like we did that summer. You should be living like we did that summer. I want to live like we did that summer. You should be living like we did that summer. I want to live like we did that summer. I want to live like we did that summer. I remember that summer as the right of the storm. Made the pavement steam like a kettle. Now, first goodbyes always seem like hours in the car park in between my house and yours. The summer holds a song we might sing forever. The winter holds a bite we never felt before. Oh. We should be living like we did that summer. I want to live like we did. Summer, we should be living like we live that summer. I want to live like we live the summer. We should be living like we live that summer. I want to live like we live the summer. It's like the ocean, you can only hold a little bit your hand. So we swim before we're broken, before our bones become black or sand.
So find a bottle of the sea breeze. I will take it over to your house and pour it loose through your garden. Tonight, oh, you got to hold it now. And you can hear it. But hotter than hell, you can You can't have these all the time. Come to me, yeah. Cause I just want to survive. There's a friend, Benjamin Hubbard, but he's a keeping me alive. Yeah. Don't need more spirit of a young man. Shadow of a car in the night. It's not the day you put no more on you. So, you can't Oh, I can't see you. I'm there. Choking on the back. Oh, I want to be an old man. I want to be an old man. I want to teach them how you got to show me how to live. He cannot see Oh, no. Run, run, don't try to be happy. Move and the things won't stop to a day. Oh, the breaks on our knees will tell you where we've been, where we have played. We played. Oh, oh, oh. I was trying to 
that's just basically yeah. Um, how about I take you from my Oh, we're building a home with the mud and the stones and the branches we find. We're all just searching for some and digging the way all the tables are fine. Oh, we play we won't stop more until we reach the sun. We are all creatures of the sun. We're all children of the day. We're just chasing what we can. One day, it's been a day, it's one. One step from the two weeks, it's done. Chasing my things, I can't We all step from the two weeks, it's done. All right, testing of the microphone, check one, two. See, that's better. Yeah. You're happy, four corners? Great. Lovely. Something to hold on to, they all mean well. Respect society given me hell. You could never feel my story. It's hard. You could never feel my story. It's hard. They are dreams come to reality of all else fail. Give out the in the company that's your hell. You could never feel my story. It's all you could never feel my story. It's all you know. Thank you. 
Oh, I swear the God child soldier was a dead. Our grace on the time We've seen the shape of our insight. Still outside the reach of them, would never be the heart to be had never belonged 
Another weekend, a new story. I found the diamond in the darkest mine. We started speaking, school talking, a tiptoe of the borderline. She left her lipstick on her cheek. Turn around, she found a shade of play. She haunted me and I come in and sleep. Wait, that's her. Stop that girl. <laughs> I said, A cold sweat in. It's hard to make it through the day to day. And they ended right when you left me. The city has been an hour as trendy. Stick on her lipstick on her cheek. I turned around, she vanished in the blink. She halted me and I'm a minute sleep. Wait, that's her. That's that girl. <laughs> I From my cheek, she vanished in the blame. The look of belly sleep. Yeah, she was very from my cheek. I turned around, she vanished in the blame. She vanished in the belly sleep. Yeah, wait, that's her. Stop that girl.
Life can be short, but life can be sweet. the next Alarms and strike and show the reflection of the capacity. Your eyes are the soul, the soul, the soul, the the soul, the soul, the soul, the soul, the the soul, the soul, the soul, the soul, the soul, the 
What gives the need for those who need a help from one? Those that will be the same when they're through the deformity. I, I, when I was young, I, I should have known better. I can't feel lonely no when you don't feel like I'm sitting there. I, I got a new girlfriend. Feels like he's on top. And I don't feel no more. And you can't see me catch my blinds. See me, I've been on my mind since the flood. Me, I falls in love. Got a big plan, you got me, and I don't feel like being alone. And you can feel it in the 
How could you ever love a girl like me? I took you to the end of my street so you could see my bones of love and stars came in the back of the tree. He's dying to be. By your side, she's walking to me. She's I'll bend to you. I don't know how to. Can you handle a girl like her? She is bolder than you think. Can you throw a girl like me? Well, she is a dream. Strikes through the midnight and a reading that she's walking to. He's dying to be.
I'm a was on fire, no one save me but you. Strange what desire will make foolish people do. I never dreamed that I could meet somebody like you. I never dreamed that I could lose somebody like you. And I don't want to fall in love. And I you don't want to fall in love with you. With you. What a wicked game you mm -hmm. play. To make me feel this way What a wicked thing to do To make me dream of you and you What a wicked thing to say You never felt this way What a wicked thing to do to make me dream of you and I And I want to fall in love And I want to fall in love With you With you. My world was on fire and no one has saved me but you. Strange what desire will make foolish people do. And I never dreamed that I'd be somebody like you. I never dreamed that I'd lose somebody like you. And I think I wanna fall in love. And I I want to fall in love with you, with you, and then. points on who yeah. Ben is. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Phonograph, I was a kid I sat with an ear close, just listening. So when the rain tapped it way down your face, you were a miracle of eyes just holding space. World time has a way, thrown it all in your face. Past she is haunted, the future is latest. Heartbreak, you know, drives a big black car. I swear, I was in the backseat, just minding my own. Through the lights, the corn crows come like rain. They won't stay, they won't stay too long now. This could be all that we know of love and all. Well, you were a dancer and I was a rag. Song in my head. That was all that I had. Oh, it was a letter I never could sign. Well, love was a contract. What a thing. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this town hall event tonight. Uh, my name is Sophie. I'm the ACT Young Woman of the Year for 2023, and it's my pleasure to be. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and it's my absolute pleasure to be emceeing tonight. Um, I hope you all enjoy the evening. So, Thank you all so much for coming. Um, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that today is Ida Hobbit Day. So that's the International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia and Transphobia. And so I'd like to extend my love and support out to the community today and always as well.
Uh, just also for everyone's awareness, we have four corners here tonight filming um, as well. So that's what the camera is here for. So wave and say hello. <laughs> So this is the second quarterly town hall uh, that Senator Pocock is holding this year. Um, it's been a really fantastic way, these town halls, to hear firsthand from the community about what uh, matters most to you. So thanks again all for coming tonight. We've got a big agenda planned for this evening. Um, and as always, the main purpose of these events is for David to hear directly from you. So there's also been a lot going on, both inside and outside Parliament, that David is keen to update you on. So as well as discussing what's coming up in the next few weeks, he'll be talking to that as well. Uh, and related to that, we also have a very special uh, guest speaker tonight, Associate Professor Ben Phillips, who is an economist at the ANU, and he's here to speak to us about last week's budget. So before commencing with the formal proceedings, I would like to invite local Nunawal elder Uncle Warren Daly to say a few words. So Uncle Warren, if he's here already. Um, oh, not a problem. So commence through. Yeah, of course. So while we wait for Uncle Warren, um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, Professor Ben Phillips to speak tonight. So we're very fortunate to have him here. He is a member of the committee. He's also a principal research fellow at the ANU Center for Social Research and Methods, and has 25 years of experience as an economic and social researcher in Australia. He manages the ANU micro simulation modeling team, which mostly focuses on the Australian tax and welfare system. And the majority of his research is in the areas of personal income tax, welfare, superannuation, and housing. So thank you very much, Ben, for agreeing to come and speak to us. And I'd love for you to come up to the stage now. Thanks. Oops. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks um, to David and the team as well for um, having me along tonight. Um, it's great to see so many people here showing so much interest. Um, so look, I'll, just, I'll just be speaking very briefly, really, just for five or so minutes, talking about the, the federal budget. Um, and mostly, there's obviously there's a lot of elements of the federal budget. I'll just be zooming in just in on the, the welfare components, or mostly just the welfare components. Um, now, as, as was mentioned, I'm a member of the Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee, and that was a committee that was set up by, by, uh, by Senator Pocock here. Um, and just as a bit of background to that, the committee was really set up to look into mostly welfare payments in Australia, looking at the adequacy of those payments. So there's a number of payments where um, the committee was particularly concerned that there was an inadequacy of the payments, so mostly the job seeker payment, um, rent assistance. There's other areas, there's many areas of welfare. It's very complicated and it's a very expensive and large part of the federal budget. It's about one in five, I think, of the dollars that are spent. Um, but on the short time that we had, we focused mostly on the job seeker payment and rent assistance and a few other areas as well. And we we um, had a finding that the job seeker payment should increase by around about two hundred and sixty dollars per fortnight. So it's currently about uh, six hundred and ninety, and we found that it needed to be increased to about nine hundred and fifty. So a very substantial increase. Um, so the job seeker payment, for those who don't know much about the welfare system, that's a payment that um, colloquially used to be known as the dole. So it's the payment that goes to people who are by and large unemployed, people between work. Um, increasingly, it's going to people who are, say, perhaps in the past would have received disability support payments or who would have received single parent payments. So it's now a bit of a broader payment than what it used to be. But So that was our main concern on the committee, and that's where we, where we wanted the most action. So moving forward now to the budget, about sort of about six months or so after the, the committee was set up by, by David, the budget recommended or has is going to put forward an increase of only $40 per fortnight. So you can do the maths on that. $40 is a long way from $260. Um, there was also an increase to rent assistance of about 15%. That probably, we didn't recommend an actual amount, but we probably were, I think, talking about a higher amount than that. But that's it's a bit of a start, I guess, for rent assistance. So, First, slightly larger increase for older Australians on the payment. Um, a particularly good part of the budget, which I think does need to be commended, is the, 
the job seeker was changed so that once your child turns 14 as opposed to eight, you move on, you're on the, the parenting payment or you stay on the parenting payment so your youngest child is 14. So that was a, a change that was made a couple of about 2006, I think it was, or 2005 by the Howard government, accelerated by the Gellard government in 2013. So it's good to see that reversed. That's an additional about $200 a fortnight for those single parents. So that's really, really helpful. Um, now, keeping in mind, I've done about 15 budgets in a row, and I think this to some extent does tend to poison your brain a little bit doing 15 budgets in a row. And I'm used to going through sort of the latter Gillard days um, and the, the Howard days, so not the Howard days, the, the Abbott days, the, the Morrison days. And this was really a period of cuts for welfare. So I've been modeling all the time cuts to welfare. So look, a positive, I realize that $40 is a long way from 260. There's a few other elements that were quite good, like the single parents, but having seen sort of 14 budgets in a row that by and large were making cuts, it is somewhat positive to see actually some improvements in the welfare system. So they're small, they're not enough, but it's moving in the right direction. I think there's a little bit of a tone of things changing a little bit. So I think there's plenty more work for the committee to do and plenty more work, no doubt, for, for David to do in that in that welfare space. Now, now, why does this matter? So I think there's lots of complex reasons why it's important to have an important and strong social safety net for Australia. But for, say, those on the job seeker payment, $690 a fortnight, I think that's just simply not enough to live on. So when you hit trouble times in your life, for, for whatever reason that might be, whether it's health issues, mental health issues, you might have a car accident, you might lose your job, all sorts of things can happen. Um, and all of a sudden you have you have no job. Um, you need to have some support there from the government. And the current approach with job seeker is too punitive. It's difficult to be on the payment and it's not enough money. And that's why the committee recommended a very significant increase. So that's Unfortunately, I think being on such a low payment makes your life more difficult than it, than it really needs to be. I think it worsens your issues in your life. So if you've got mental health issues, it's only likely to make those issues worse. If you need to go and get a job or you want to go and get a job, which most people on Job Seeker are trying to do, it only makes that more difficult if you're only on six ninety a fortnight. Do, do you have enough money to go and buy a suit? Do you have enough money for a haircut? Um, if you've got some health issues in your life, do you have enough money to pay for those things and medicine? So I think that's why it or well, why it matters. Uh, so I think, um, look, I really commend David on his work with getting the the committee together. I think that's a great start. I think it's having some impact. I think the the increases we did see it's not enough for most people. I get that. Um, unfortunately, the longer you're in sort of around these budgets, you know, around around politics, things do unfortunately move slowly. But I do think it's moving in the right direction. But obviously, there needs to be a lot more work to get that payment where it needs to be. So thank you very much. Unfortunately, I've got to disappear um, myself tonight. Um, but if you've got any questions to me directly, I'm happy to, to get emails or you can get on Twitter. I am on Twitter and you can direct message me there. Um, so I'm happy to, to chat, but uh, unfortunately, I've got to head off. But thank you very much again tonight, David, and enjoy the rest of the night. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, for your time and your insight tonight. It's really fascinating to hear from you. Um, now, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Uncle Warren Daly, a local Nunawal elder, and I'd like to invite him up to say a few words. Thank you, Uncle Warren. So, um, thanks very much for that. Firstly, I'm, uh, my name, those that don't know me, I'm Warren Daly. I'm one of the Nunawal elders. Um, been in Canberra 20 years, but you wouldn't believe it tonight. I went over to Philip, got lost. That's that's the uh, thing of living on the north side, you know, you don't travel over here very often. So, forgive me for that. So, yes, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, my name's Warren Daly. I'm happy to give this welcome to country for uh, Senator David Pocock. This is my second welcome I've done for him, so I must go all right. So, um, firstly, I acknowledge my elders, those past, present, and emerging, and I thank them for their continuing contributions they have made to life in this city and region. I'd also like to welcome Mother Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, all nationalities attending tonight's important event. For some of you, this may be your first welcome to country and the Ngunnawal people being the custodians of Canberra for over 60,000 years. Our elders have passed down this tradition to us. Before you were to enter another person's country, you'd always announce you've arrived, not enter until you were asked to do so by an elder or traditional owner. 
as in the white man's world, you wouldn't want a neighbor or total stranger entering your yard or home without first asking permission to do so. The reason we do this is to protect you while you're in animal country, but it also shows respect to us, the people and the country you've entered. For those of you that have traveled to be with us, have a safe and enjoyable journey home to your loved ones, and in ending, Nagana Yarabi Yangu, you're all welcome to leave your footprints on the land of the Nanawa people. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uncle Warren. And yes, I'd like to extend my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in the audience today as we gather on Nunawal and Embry land. So moving on. Apologies, I'm looking at my phone. That's why I keep looking down. So over the past few weeks, um, Dave has been inviting the community to submit their questions over Slido. Hopefully a few of you have done so. So while you can't submit any more questions now, you can upvote existing questions and then ask your own questions from the floor in a little while. So to see and upvote Slido questions, just scan the QR code on the screen behind me or go to slido.com and enter the code POCOC23. So there will also be an opportunity to continue the conversation after the formal proceedings close. So just find someone wearing a fabulous Team Pocock shirt and they can help you. Um, but for now, I'd like to invite Senator David Pocock to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Sophie. And thank you, Uncle Warren, for, for the welcome. I, I'd like to acknowledge you and uh, Donald Alders uh, past and and, and present. Thank you all so much for, for coming out tonight. Uh, I've really loved these events, getting to one here from, from, we try and get sort of an expert to talk about something that's, that's topical. I generally present what has been happening in parliament, looking forward a bit and then really open it up to, to questions. For me, the most valuable thing is, is hearing what people are either concerned about or want to know more about um, that's happened or always coming up issues that you want to let me know about. After the last one, we decided that um, I'm taking honest feedback from my team was maybe a bit boring me just giving a, an update without anything on the screen. So we're going to try to have some stuff on the screen and see how it, see how it goes. Uh, it, it has been a massive few months for the team in, in Parliament House. I'm, I'm honestly just so uh grateful to have the team i have they work so hard to get across a mountain of legislation the safeguard mechanism was was an absolute beast um in the end of the 16 recommendations that we put to the government um a bunch of them were either in full or, or, or partly accepted there were some that were you know weren't and you know that's been quite public but that went through um followed by uh, you know, one, one of the concerns that gets raised with me is the impact that horses are having on our Alpine national parks. They're starting to come into uh, Namaji. This has been a political football for a long time. And so an inquiry to actually look at the science, see what, what needs to be done to protect you know, over 30 threatened species in, um, in, the Alpine, in the Alpine areas. The administrative burden on um, small businesses, talking to small businesses in the, in the ACT, there's been a real concern about the lack of consultation with the whole range of legislation that's come through. And so there'll be an inquiry to actually hear from small businesses, see how administrative burden is, is affecting them um, and whether or not there's ways to actually you know, ensure that they don't have to carry that. Um, we heard about the, um, the committee's report I've been very vocal saying that I, I think there was a real missed opportunity in this budget. Labor has just so much political capital and a budget surplus. And I would have loved to have seen that go to Australians who desperately need that support. Yes, Australians, even people with, with incomes, good incomes are, are also feeling the pinch with mortgages, but we really need to recognize that there are people in our communities making we hear a lot about tough decisions. There's people deciding whether to, to eat or not so they can afford um, you know, to fulfill a script at the pharmacy. In parliament, there's hundreds of these parliamentary friends of groups. We have started a, a parliamentary friends of clean investment with Senator Karen Grogan and Andrew, Senator Andrew Bragg. 
really as a way to allow you know people from all parties to hear from investors um, what they're looking at what how big the opportunity is for the for the uh, energy transition clearly this is such a huge challenge there's a role for government um, to invest but there's an even bigger role for government to ensure that we have the right settings that unlocks much larger private capital to ensure that we can uh, get this transition happening in time so we've had the first one it was it was it was great a really good event and we'll continue to do them started talking about a Canberra region city partnership in the last budget yes there were um, improvements there was a big chunk of money for the cultural institutions which I welcome they've been neglected for for some time my argument to the government is that that is great it's the national capital there should be that sort of investment in our cultural institutions but that's not necessarily for Canberra the the city and we're still last on the list when it comes to infrastructure spending we've been there for for a, for a decade now and consulting with people in the community with um you know tourism organizations you know the the convention bureau uh, there's a real need to have a bigger vision for our city we're the fastest growing capital city and i don't think we've seen the kind of investment in infrastructure that actually speaks to a bigger bolder vision for what we can be as a city and how we deal with the big challenges we're, we're facing so a big central part of the city partnership is around housing how do we unlock more supply particularly in in civic close to services we've seen a whole bunch of um, social housing moved out of there and i think there's a real opportunity to have more housing and ensure that 20 percent of that is social and affordable so something you'll hopefully hear a lot more about we've written to the pm and the chief minister and we'll hopefully be hearing back soon so we can um we can keep pushing it along the national reconstruction fund uh, also passed canberra has the most startups per capita in the country like there's an incredible startup to, um sort of scene here in here in canberra and i think it's a huge opportunity for Canberra to continue to diversify. And one of the challenges we face is we have a lot of startups and then they go elsewhere. And an opportunity for us is to actually capture more of that value here to ensure that startups can stay here because you talk to them and they desperately want to. They love being in Canberra. There's a huge number of advantages of actually being in a smaller, more connected city. So one of the things we really push the government on, the National Reconstruction Fund is, $15 billion to be invested in companies that are at sort of scale up point. They've got a product ready to go and they want to start manufacturing here. The thing I've been hearing is the missing pieces in between that startups who are trying to get to that point where they can take the big money. And that's been a real, um, it's been a real gap. We've seen a, a number of companies go overseas rather than stay here in Australia. And, and in the budget, the government actually committed, I think $360 million to having at that startup incubator. So um, Tom on my team um, did some great work on that and, and Fiona through the negotiations. Again, back to the budget, we heard from, um, we heard from, from Ben, clearly some good stuff for health, um, $3.7 billion uh, to incentivize bulk billing. We're still not sure if that's actually going to improve things i think for existing bulk billing practices it, it will but we're, we're not sure if it's actually going to incentivize doctors who currently don't bulk bill to bulk bill so we're waiting for more details and we're going to use estimates next week next week to dig into that canberra has one of the lowest ratios of doctors to population in the country worse than you know rural and remote new south wales and victoria We've got one of the lowest bulk billing rates, the highest gap fee. These are all things you know. Um, and so we, we really are talking to, to, the health, um, to the health minister about this and really keen to see this deliver for, for Canberrans because clearly there's a huge need there. Started talking more about the, the transparency around sponsored passes. Um, has anyone seen that in the news? No? Okay. So this is, this is something we've been taking up with... Um, 
the Speaker of the House and the, the President of the Senate. Uh, this is all new to me. As a, as a parliamentarian, I get to sponsor passes. Um, so I, I can put in a form saying either I've known Lincoln for 12 months and then he just automatically gets a pass. Access all areas, 24 hours a day, you swipe in at security and you're in. If I don't know Lincoln, he can simply su supply a letter um, that they sort of, I guess, decide whether or not it's, I don't know, bona fide or I don't know what the process is. It's pretty loose. <laughs> and currently there's 1,800 of these people running around Parliament House that we have no idea who they are. And we know that there are a huge number of lobbyists on sponsored passes. We've got the lobbyist uh, register, but I would argue that the majority of people are on these passes. And I think people should deserve to know. I, I don't, I think it should be accessible, but there should be transparency around who is going into the building. And for me, like it's a good check on everyone. If if I know it's going to be public, I've decided to put on my website for that reason. I want to actually think about am I willing to put my name to this person? So we'll keep we'll keep pushing them on this. Um, the government has indicated that it's not something they support, but it seems like the entire crossbench thinks it's a good idea. So um, we'll keep pushing. We'll keep pushing them on that. You may have seen Suburb Zero at the front. Um, amazing group doing really uh, great work building the case for um, the acceleration of electrification in Canberra. There are huge cost savings for electrification. The challenge we face, though, is this is technology that we know at some point is going to be cheaper and Everyone will just make those decisions. At the moment, it's wealthier people who can benefit from that, who can afford an EV, who can afford to put solar on their roof. And the real challenge, and, and I'll argue the opportunity, is to actually work through the regulatory issues now to ensure that we have uh, rules in place that ensure that no one's left behind. It's a huge opportunity when people are feeling the pinch um, from, you know, mortgage rates uh, going up, interest rates going up um, to actually be saving thousands of dollars every year. So we're, we're pushing the, the um, making the case to the federal government to fund a pilot um, to ensure that that is used to actually work through some of these issues and then implement those, the things that we learn more broadly. Um, and we had an electrified parliament event with uh, most of the crossbench. You can see um, Helen Haynes, Kylie Tink, Monique Ryan, Kate Cheney, and, and, and a bunch of a bunch of others. Um, Minister Ed Husek came and spoke. So I think it's something that really is starting to snowball a bit in Parliament and we're we're hearing the government talk a lot more about electrification. I mean, the, the, one of the things I've found most challenging, um, to be really honest, the, the the last six months or so is balancing just the huge legislative um, sort of agenda with still wanting to get out and talk to people. Uh, and so we've really tried to ensure that we are getting out. We, we're doing regular small business um, tours. We've started uh, doing... Um, the coffee shops, mobile offices, we call them, which has been great. Um, look out, it's a great way to come down and have a coffee and, uh, and chat. We had the rally and then round tables for me are just so valuable. You know, Canberra is a city of experts, um, experts who are very willing to give you their opinion, which is a great thing. And we've been, <laughs> we've been using that. We've had, we've had round tables on all sorts of things and the uh, disability uh, NDIS roundtable is tomorrow. Um, all the other ones we've we've um, we've had already, and we'll continue to to do this. And and we've had a bunch of people get in touch and say, listen, you know, I've got expertise in this area. If you wanna if you wanna use me, so thanks to everyone who's done that. Um, I'm off on Friday to Minidi Lakes. Water is something that it's obviously a big a big issue, um, and. I went to Daniloquin earlier in the year with um, 
on the invitation of Senator um, Perrin Davey to talk to irrigators there, to talk to environmental groups, um, First Nations groups. The Murray-Darling Basin plan um, comes to an end in a couple of years, and there, I'm sure there's going to be a big, big fight over what, what comes next. And it actually really does matter for, for, for Canberra. You know, we've got the Murrumbidgee running through here. That is our backup town water. And the current setup really isn't working for us where the Murrumbidgee is, the flows are basically administered by Snowy Hydro. And the only thing that they look at is flows. They're not taking into account the environment. They're not taking into account cultural use um, or even social. They're not, they're not thinking about towns downstream like us who may need that water in a drought. And in fact, in the last drought, Icon actually ordered some water from Snowy paid for it and arrived and wasn't good enough quality to drink. So it really is a concern looking at potentially going into a bit of a drought um, cycle and something that I, I'm really keen for the government to start to address now before it's, a, before it's an issue. Uh, we've got two weeks of Senate estimates. Um, so any public servants have any uh, hot scoops, send them through. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've, been, we've been preparing... For that, it's it's such a uh, such a useful way of of getting more information out or trying to get more information out. Some of the some of the public servants are very good at uh, not answering. Um, and then in June we've got two weeks, which I I just don't know how we're going to get through all the legislation. There's so much packed in there, so that should be a lot of fun. Obviously, the housing fund is sort of um, sitting there and hasn't hasn't passed yet. So the negotiations ongoing between the government and the Greens on that, but aside from that, there's a huge amount to get through. So that's about, that's about it. Um, what else did we have here? You know, some of the, um, just reflecting on the budget, one of, one of the really disappointing things for me was the lack of, um, new money for threatened species. Uh, I think it's, it's something that probably gets lost when we're, we're consumed with costs of living. But I really think as one of the wealthiest countries in the world, we should be investing more into our environment. We're part of nature. Uh, I think it's on all of us to advocate to be spending enough to actually look after this incredible place. And I guess that links to the, some of the upcoming legislation is around this nature repair market. We had a round table yesterday on that, looking at it. Um, not a huge fan from what I've seen, but we'll continue to, to sort of get, get our heads around it and, and start to consult with, with people in the community um, about it and you know, continue to make the case for why we should be investing in nature. I think that's probably enough talking for me. Maybe we go to some go to some questions. All right, so we'll be moving on to the Q and A portion of the evening. Um, so we're going to start with a few of the um, pre requested questions from Slido. Um, so I'll read them out, and hopefully they'll be on the screen behind me. So yeah, um, first question: What are your policies to help renters in Canberra? And what are your thoughts about increasing housing density in inner Canberra for infill versus urban sprawl? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, clearly, supply in Canberra is a is a real challenge, and part of the city partnership is is really trying to increase that supply in in central Canberra. It's part of Griffin's plan was to have a much more sort of urban center have a lot more housing mixed use i think really importantly there needs to be that social and affordable component we've got so many frontline workers who simply can't afford to live anywhere close to where they where they work i mean other other things that i think really affect renters is looking at um, the national construction code actually ensure that we're building houses that are better to live in, that are more energy efficient, that there are far better standards around that. And then starting to talk to the government about ways to actually uh, tweak the tax incentives for, for landlords to actually want to put on solar and you know, better insulation 
Like there, there's some small tweaks there around depreciation, which I think could make a make a big make a big difference there. Thank you. Now, question two: um, Would you and other senators consider blocking all non-essential legislation until the stage three tax cuts were abolished or completely redesigned to be fairer? I mean, it's chaotic enough in there as it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is something I've been pushing since since I got in there. I I, I don't think that. I don't actually think they should be abolished. My argument is that there's elements in there which I think are valid. Some of the bracket creep, particularly down the the, the bottom end of the tax cuts, um, you are capturing more people um, just by fact of inflation and 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 salaries going up. But at the top end, you know, over half of this is going to people over one hundred and eighty, two hundred thousand dollars a year. I think there's a really good argument to use that money better in our communities across Australia. I won't be blocking things uh, like that, but I'll continue to make the case for why I think it's good for better for our communities to use that money in a in a different way. I'm certainly hearing from people that that's what that's what they want. And you know, I think if the major parties want to continue with these sorts of policies that actually leave people behind, then um, I think they kick in just before the next election and you know, people will be able to decide then. And the final question from Slido. So will you lobby for federal funding to help rebuild Woden's lost sporting infrastructure, for example, an aquatic centre and an indoor sports centre? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because some of, some of this is obviously territory but there is definitely precedent for federal funding for infrastructure and clearly there are big challenges in in Woden and I would argue I think there's been a lack of planning and having a, a longer term um, sort of plan for different infrastructure projects to ensure that communities have pools that are accessible that there are sport that there is sporting infrastructure uh we've we held a round table last year with i think most of the sports um and have been working on what what does it look like what are the priorities and certainly woden is i think top of top of the list for a, for a, for a couple of them uh and we'll be taking that to the ACT government and hoping that they they don't have a plan, so hopefully they develop a plan. But then also, I think importantly, start to ask the federal government for some for some co-funding um, for really important um, projects. And I know there's there's a bunch of amazing advocates here for for Woden. Um, so thank you for all the work that you're you're doing in, in continuing to raise this as an issue on the south side. Uh. Um, so we'll now move on to take questions from the floor. Um, I would just like to remind everyone to keep your questions as brief and direct as possible and to make sure they are questions. Um, but for now, there'll be a roving mic moving around, but I'll pass on to you, Dave. Thanks, Liv. Uh, thank you. Is this? I don't know. Yeah. yeah um, so uh, my question is primarily around um, like Canberra Stadium. Uh -huh. So I know that you ran on a position that you wanted to move Canberra Stadium towards the city and uh -huh. the NRL seems to be highly promoting that. Will you um, protect existing infrastructure on the north side, primarily the AIS, AIS aquatic facilities, um, AIS track, um, rather than just spend previous, previously on highly expensive stadiums, which we've seen as quite um, opposed from the community in areas like Tasmania? Um, yeah, I guess that's my question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And I think yeah, the Tasmanian uh, situation there with the stadium, I think has really highlighted the need to listen to the community. Um, and that was a big reason why I didn't ask, didn't put any ask um, in this budget. I don't think it's the right time. I think we need to consult and have a have a plan. On the Tasmania example, I would argue that Canberra is slightly different in that our stadium's coming to the end of its life. If we don't do something, we're going to have no stadium 
So it's going to have to be rebuilt at some point. For me, it's about where should that be to actually set us up? Absolutely. I'll be pushing to have one, have the AIS here in Canberra. I think it should be here. And I think we should be investing in it. I know they were, they were really disappointed that they didn't get money in the budget to actually upgrade their facilities and particularly to make them more wheelchair accessible. It, it, you know, they pride themselves on being one of the best um, sort of para, uh, Paralympic training venues in the world. And they want to build on that. So I think we've really got to value that with the, um, the stadium and, and, and convention, convention center in the city. For me, it's about creating a, a precinct that can really benefit a whole host of other businesses. Has your position changed or is it currently the same as yeah. previous that you ran on? So you ran on like moving a civic state, like having a civic yeah. stadium. Is that still your position or have you changed your position? No, I'm still I'm still advocating for that. I think having a having a precinct there where you combine a stadium and convention center, there's significant cost savings for one. And I think if if we don't combine them, it's very hard to make the case for two sort of separate um, spends. And we've seen precincts uh, being developed close to cities because that's increasing what people want is that that game day experience or that concert experience where you go out, have dinner go to the game, you know, go watch the concert and then you can maybe, if you're young, go out again or if you're um, like me or anyone, anyone else, go straight to bed. <laughs> is that... What are you looking cons- more to the point is would you be then like compromising with the government to sell the existing infrastructure on the north side? Um, I guess like more on that, like th- almost on that third question, like, you know, the existing like uh track uh-huh. there's like parking there's there's like soccer fields that are all accessible uh-huh. in an area that's already quite dense in west belcon and kind of underrepresented um in terms of uh-huh. uh you know public amenities would you be willing to sell that well it's i, I mean, in, I mean in, it's you know to pay for a quite an expensive venture for a city stadium which is quite unpopular amongst the community I mean, that land is AIS um, and it would be up to the Sports Commission and the Commonwealth Government as to what they did with that land. Uh, my understanding, um, both talking to Kieran Perkins and, and his public comments and what he said at estimates is they want to keep it. They, they value it. They see that as part of their long-term future and their, their vision for, for growing and continuing to build on the AIS. And I really support that. You know, when the AIS was set up, it was world-leading. And countries around the world looked at Australia and said, "Oh, we need we need to do this," and, and they've done that, but they've continued to develop it, and we've we built it and and have just sort of, I don't know, got complacent about it. So I think we should continue to invest in it. You know, should the stadium be moved, there will be a conversation about what happens to that land, um, and I'm sure part of it will be how do you make the AIS more sustainable, funding wise, and I, I don't know what that'll look like, but I'm very happy to chat more and thank um, you for your time this, and your response. Yep. As this sort of it. evolves, because yeah, it's an important one. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Hi. Um, Australia has a lot of natural resources, uh-huh. and currently our, our current taxation system means that as, as Australians, we get chump change. Once these things are gone, once they're mined, once they're extracted, it's not as if my children or my children's children can ever get benefit from stuff that's extracted now. Uh What is your view on how do we change the government's mind and say, look, we really should get better value Mm -hmm. to the Australian people Mm -hmm. for these resources that once they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, I could agree more. We, we, we're not getting a fair return for our resources. You know, the government has talked about the petroleum resource rent tax, which is there because there's no royalty on offshore gas and oil. And so they set up this PRT. Currently, there's not a single offshore gas project that has paid a cent. and 
they made an extra $40 billion last year. It's just outrageous. It's not working. And Labor have proposed essentially tweaking it, which just brings forward when companies that we're going to at some point pay PRT just brings it forward and they'll pay it a bit earlier. And then there's a whole bunch of other companies who are never going to pay it. And now there's going to be a tiny sort of base minimum amount that they have to pay. Like that, that's, it's, it's not good enough for me. And, and again, I think this is something that the, the entire crossbench is agitating on and is going to really try and push them when they do put forward this, this change to PRT to do it properly, because you're right. Once, once they're gone, they're gone. And we've seen in other jurisdictions, you know, Norway is sitting on a $1.8 trillion sovereign wealth fund because they said, this is our oil. You can, you can tap into it and sell it, but we're going to tax you because it's our oil. And the oil company said, oh, well, if you do that, then we won't invest, which we're hearing now from gas. And the Norwegian government said, okay, well, you know, that's your decision. And the following week they came back and said, oh, actually, we might, we might still invest in, in oil. So, you know, I, th I think the, the problem is, is that we see every time there's even a mention of changing it, like there is at the moment, the gas lobby, the gas companies come out and make all these claims about, well, you're going to kill our investment, you're going to do this, and the major parties don't don't do anything. Uh, so I really think we've got to we've got to push this, and um, yeah, it's it's I think it's it's pretty fun being on the crossbench because you've got you know Pauline Hansen as fired up about this as the Greens. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, we'll see where it lands, but we're certainly we're certainly pushing them on on that. And you know, then I think the next thing is looking forward to the next you know mining boom when it comes to critical minerals. And the same thing, Australians should benefit from that uh, to actually be able to invest in things that benefit us and can set us up for for the future. Hi, David. Um, Hi. I wanted to ask you about the NDIS. Yes. Um, there just seemed to be a lot of vagaries, quite frankly, in the budget and the yes. way that was spoken about. Um, I'm the parent of somebody who's got an NDIS plan and I spend a lot of time talking with other parents and carers. Um, understand that there's lots of um, dodgy operators out there and that does blow the budget on NDIS and that sort of thing. But there's a very big fear that the way that the government claws that back is by cutting plans mm -hmm. and um, the families and the participants mm -hmm. themselves end up being impacted. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered what your views mm -hmm. on that were. Thank you. It's a great question. We're still trying to work out that they've committed to a reduction in spending, but there really is no detail about how they get that. And... We've got a roundtable tomorrow to hear from people to see what they what they're thinking, what they've what they've heard, and we'll be asking the government for more detail around that. I think you're right. Like th there's a legitimate um, cause to go after dodgy operators and 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 clean that up. But at the same time, I think when we talk about the NDIS and funding, we've got to remember we're talking about people here. Um, you, know, you often hear on on radio people just throwing out numbers and statistics, but for so many in our community, this is a life-changing scheme. And this was set up to actually ensure that people with a disability uh, get the support they need to actually be able to contribute and be part of society. Um, so I think it's a great thing. We've just, we've got to make sure that it's, it's working and it's, it's actually delivering. So I, I don't have an answer for you on that, but we will be, we'll be using estimates um, and yeah, we'll hopefully know a bit more tomorrow. Like to the views of the, the, um, disability advocates and organisations in Canberra. Thank you. Just coming back Hello. to more local issues, uh -huh. I'm just curious as to what uh, leverage you have in your role with the ACT government, because in the community there's growing, I think, concern about the role of developers and how the government seems to just roll over or be in bed with them. And so how do we represent that and to what degree you can help us with those concerns? Mm -hmm. 
especially things like the loss of the Philip Paul and other mm -hmm. areas where infrastructure is just going. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, it's a challenge finding that that line between, yeah, that's something that people raise with me all the time. And so when I meet with relevant ministers, I'll raise it with them and say, listen, this is being, I often write to them about these sorts of issues. You know, they're committed to a developer's register. I don't think they've done it yet. Um, the other thing that we've been pushing, which is does have federal sort of jurisdiction security of payments. We're seeing all these building companies go under and then you know, all the subcontractors and tradies owed thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars for work that they've already done. And I've been really disappointed by um, both, you know, both the major parties and their lack of willingness to actually put that in place. Um, and you kind of have to ask questions: Why? Who? Who they? Who they doing it for? So certainly something I I, I do raise with them, but yeah, you know, I don't want to be there spending constantly sort of bagging local politicians about local issues but uh, I'm, I'd love to chat later and sort of see if there's a specific thing we can maybe help help out with Good. thank you yeah David um Warren again listen I'm, I'm pulling on the um Ranger hat now yes you've mentioned two things you've mentioned um the Brumbies I actually um done the work in the country for that their film that they brought out about where the water begins. Mm -hmm. And on that, that just shows you mm -hmm. the way to get rid of the Brumbies is the best is the aerial, aerial shot, kill them, stone dead, you know. But people, the, the, all these good people out there that are saying they shouldn't be, they shouldn't be hurt or they shouldn't be killed. Have a look at what it's doing to the environment up there. You mentioned there's there's a robbery frog up there that's endangered. There's a long tooth mouse up there, and there's also a lizard. Now, the best thing if you ever watch that film is that you may shoot them from the air, but when these brumbies are walking around in when it's um, water's all up there and they're getting stuck and they're dying, people are forgetting that, you know, we're trying to keep them free or more than probably three, the frog, the mouse and um, the lizard. We're trying to keep them, mm -hmm. but people are going on. When them brumbies are getting um, slaughtered or, you know, not so many of them, people are chucking them, letting brumbies, putting brumbies back in there. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. a no-win situation. Yeah. The other thing you brought up was... Um, as I said, I'm a ranger out there. We brought back three animals. Um, they found some uh, bones out in Wee Jasper Caves, and it was a mouse. And it's not a little mouse, it's a big chestnut, brown chestnut mouse. They brought 10 of them back. I actually done welcome to my back to back to country, oh. <laughs> which I don't think anybody else has. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, there's the... Um, there's a quail out there, the beton. We're looking at bringing in the buzzard. Um, so they've also just opened up a uh, wild bark. So anybody that, that hasn't been out there, just go and have yeah, a look. That's what we're checking it out. It is. We were, it there is. Last, we were there last night for an event, and it's a, it's it's a spectacular um, community yeah. visitor centre at, at Mulligan's Flat. Yeah. Thanks, Uncle Warren. Yes, great. Thanks for the work you do with AST Parks. Um, we, do. we do some good stuff, mate. Yeah. You know, as it is. Yeah. Just never ending. <laughs> Back on country, I, I've only been there a while, but should have been there all the time. You know, it's great. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, mate. Thank you. And, you know, I think you highlight on the horses. It's a really sensitive issue. You know, I, I grew up on a farm riding horses, loved horses. Um, they're amazing animals, but they, they just, I don't think they belong in our national parks. And they love the brumbies, mm -hmm. yes, fair enough. But if they're not cold, they're getting stuck in the mud and they're dying from not eating. Yeah. You know, so if you mind, you get too many, we're gonna lose them three the frog. Yeah, no, I think there's yeah, there's a there's a bunch of species.
red, black, and yellow. Uh -huh. We let the team work on that. Yeah. That's one that came with it. That was real. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're little. I've never actually seen one, seen one in the wild. So I'll have to get out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Uncle Warren. <laughs> you talked about you talked about cultural flows. Yep. Now we had a two day meeting out at Namaji last week, Thursday, Friday. I could not believe that something that falls in the ground, if you're smart enough to dam it, you can sell that water. Now, there's so many billion, and the Indigenous or Aboriginals are getting 0.0000.2%, which is next to nothing. Mm -hmm. So we've never even realised that water is a commodity. So Certainly look at is. government when we're coming at you because <laughs> because we're coming at you for payment for water. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge issue. You know, as uh, there's been forty million dollars for cultural flows sitting there for a long time, and they just haven't spent it. And last year they didn't spend it. Um, yeah. Not all people now know about it. Yeah. All right. We'll, wonder, we'll chat after. We'll get on to them. I wonder if um, those flows count in Yarralumla Creek. Um, Yarralumla Creek that runs from the south of Woden through to the lake is uh, quite degraded and mm -hmm. it's a concrete drain. Mm -hmm. So it would be really great if we could naturalise, invest in naturalising yep. the creek and and bring back the biodiversity and some mm -hmm. amenity. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think you know, urban waterways, is, it's a huge challenge. It was, um, I guess, a school of thought a while ago that the best thing to do was just put some concrete down and get the water to the lake as quickly as possible. Clearly that's not the solution. The, the lake is struggling with things like blue green algae. And I think as Canberra gets bigger and more people are wanting to use the lake and walk around it, I think there's going to be more awareness and more desire to actually have a healthier lake. I don't think it should take that, but it, you know, I think there's going to be more pressure on it and it starts with the waterways. I know the government has committed more money to, um, urban waterways. I'm not too sure how that's going to be divvied up. Yeah, the problem is though, you know, there's tensions in town planning and we don't have that planning. So we don't look at all the different aspects of the social development, the economic development. And um, so along the Yarralumla Creek, along the Athlon Drive corridor, you've got the tensions of it being zoned and on the land release program for high density housing. You've got duplication of the Athlon Drive. You've got a tram and you've got all these different things going into that corridor. And I'm afraid that the high density housing, the land will be released for that before we ever even consider how we fit all these things in that corridor mm -hmm. and, and what's a good plan for that corridor. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Uh I'm looking forward to seeing the updated plans coming out soon-ish, next few months. Oh, well, we've got the district strategies. Strategies. Um, which probably will get passed in mid-year, mid the new planning bill. Okay. But um, there just doesn't seem it's to be any will to do anything like, you know, we have talk, we have policies, but we don't see them implemented mm -hmm. around here. Mm -hmm. We, we, you know, the, our local government will say that they're investing a lot in Woden because they're investing in the tram, and there's a CIT that's got um, logistics. You know, like the the dump trucks will come into the ground floor instead of that being a great place for the community. Um, so it's just very difficult to get good outcomes. Yeah. Just yeah. looking at the characters that you develop as like at a rapid speed, yeah. it's just becoming outrageous. Yeah. And there's no foresight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a serious challenge. Uh, um, I'd love to chat more, Fiona, after this, and I, I don't know what can be done in, in terms of the sequencing of that, um, but. Again, you know, potentially going into drought, I think the health of the lake is going to become an issue again. And I think it's trying to point to that to, to actually prioritise you know, the things that should be prioritised ahead of 
or currently is. Look, you know, we're happy to have densification yeah. because we need yeah. homes for people, but we want to have a balance between, um, you know, jobs and public spaces and community facilities and the environment and, and town planning is a balance yeah. and we need help. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And I think there's, you know, there's a few examples of Canberra doing it well. I think the, the Canberra, um, the C5 building in, in Campbell, they started with the park, they put in the park, they put in the little wetland, and then they developed the, the, um, the sort of housing mixed use. And I think a lot of people love it. Um, there doesn't seem to be that same sort of foresight of saying, well, what, what are people going to want in this area? And I know we've talked about the challenges in Woden with that, where it's just seems like there's a new tower going up and well, where are people going to walk, you know, exercise, um, take their dog if they've got one. Um, yeah, I agree. Hi. Um, Hi. So a couple of things. There's grants at the moment for like developing like park areas and stuff and the, for like community led things um you could ask for one for the Yarralumla Creek area maybe if you wanted to work on it um because our class what uh we were in the same conservation class last year yeah nice. uh, at Bruce CIT and our class on the group chat has been talking about um a couple of like the Everett areas really needing like better drainage systems uh -huh. and stuff um and you can get grants to work on waterways and things at the moment I don't remember the specific details, but I could okay. We can maybe look it. them up and 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 send them out. Yeah. Um, maybe, but I think they're like small community, like um, like Parkland grants. Uh huh. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a huge. Oh, okay. Big project. Yeah, but we'll, we'll certainly look into them, and we can maybe send around the links when we find them in the next update yeah um the other one was i want to know like what because i'm i don't know i'm sort of a i'm in support of culling horses um but because i don't know i feel like it's as warren uncle warren said that it's um i guess like more ethical for both them and like it's not an ethical death for like the other things in the environments so that they're like trashing uh -huh if they can't live like that. Uh, but I don't know, like what's, I guess I want to know like what sort of plans you would support for it in mm -hmm. terms of that. I guess the, like this, this is why we've, we, we worked with, you know, got, we got support from everyone really in the, in, in the Senate to have an inquiry to actually look at it. Like, let's look at the science of what's, what's happening in these ecosystems. What impact are horses having? What are the numbers? Um, what needs to be done? What should the target be? I think currently there's a target to have 3,000 horses in there. Should it be that? Should it be less? Should it be none? Uh, and then what are the ways to actually get them out? What are, what are the most humane ways? What's that going to cost? Who's going to fund it? All of those sorts of things. And really to be have, have a plan that is taking into account the ecology of the area and it's you know, the, th the threat that horses uh, pose, but then also the, the humane treatment of animals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem is that with across the board, you look at the, the explosion in numbers of deer. Yeah, you know, there are literally millions of deer now along the East Coast. And yeah. And they're having a huge effect. So I think, you know, this is, it's, it's something that's, I think, uncomfortable for some people. It is just a hard reality here in Australia where we didn't have any hard hooved animals and we've got no predators to keep them in check. And they're having a, a huge impact on our, on our native wildlife. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, before asking a question, just thank you for, you and your team for all the work that you've already done. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't vote for you, but I will next time. Thank you. Then <laughs> just a quick bit of information. I know that the New South Wales Parks and Wildlife 
people did a review of the Brumbies within the last five years. It was a scientific panel. It included ethicists and veterinarians and so on. They made recommendations. They had a plan. This is for the snowy mountains, mm -hmm. of course, but that's where the problem mm -hmm. is for us, isn't it? Um, so you may already know this, but if you... Mm -hmm. Other, if you don't, maybe mm -hmm. somebody could grab hold of that mm -hmm. report and have a look mm -hmm. at it. And it seems to me that it just lacked political will mm -hmm. in the end to implement mm -hmm. the recommendations. Yeah, and thank it's you. been five years and it's gotten a lot worse uh -huh. since then. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Okay. And then the other one's just a quick question, and um, it's one that may take years to resolve, but... Uh, today's Canberra Times was full of news of the um, changes in the military. Obviously, everybody's a lot more aware of the changes in, in military might in the world. Um, I, I think that also we're wanting to change our constitution with the, with the demise of Queen Elizabeth and so on and so forth. In looking at the Constitution, it's vague about how we give, um, make the decision to go to war, to send people overseas to foreign lands to fight. And in the past, it's been that decision's been made by a governor general, it's been made by a prime minister. With Iraq, it was made when parliament wasn't sitting, mm -hmm. uh, troops were sent over. It's not good enough and it's scary. And I think that. Um, it would be a really good time to look at that process and get it right. Mm -hmm. And personally, I would like to see a process that didn't rest on the decision of one person because we've had in recent history a prime minister who was a bit wild with the power, making himself secret ministers of this and that. We don't know if the next prime minister uh, could be some somebody just as bad. So we want to have... The opportunity is the people of Australia who send the bodies overseas to, to be part of the debate, mm -hmm. if not the decision about when we mm -hmm. go to war overseas. Mm -hmm. So that's my Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, this I think this is something that people have been pushing for a long time, sort of war, war powers reform, and there has been some talk in the Senate. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the challenges is the major parties believe that it is up to the government of the day to just decide that. I think that on the crossbench, there's a different view in that while there should be the ability for the prime minister or the, or the cabinet to react quickly when they need to, at some point it should go through parliament to say, yes, we're going to commit to this as elected representatives. Um, so I think it's going to be an on, ongoing conversation but i think at the moment there's 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 not the political will to actually to actually change that but you know who know, who knows how that could change i think it's just going to take more awareness from you know people in the public to actually say well this is something that i think is is sensible yeah but thanks for raising that david uh, peter dutton in his budget reply speech actually floated a new idea or not a new idea but an idea um of doing reform to advertising of gambling. Mm -hmm. um, my question would be firstly, what, what's your view on that? And secondly, does that does this really present an opportunity for the crossbench to achieve something with Andrew Wilkie in the lower house? Mm -hmm. I mean, the crossbench have been pushing this for, I don't know how long, you know, since Nick Xenophon, um, Andrew Wilkie has been doing some great work. Uh, Rebecca Sharkey has been talking about it. And I think now with the, with the bigger crossbench in the lower house, they're concerned about it. I'm certainly concerned about it and, and will continue to push, you know, um, the opposition leader now saying something after, you know, nine years. This, this has been a problem for a while, but I think it is getting to a level that people in our communities across the country are saying we've had enough. And you don't just feel like you're seeing more advertising. You are. Um, Gambling companies are spending $300 million a year advertising to Australians. And as the return on that is Australians are losing $25 billion a year. We're the biggest losers in the world per capita. Uh, it's extraordinary. 
um, you know, 10 years ago, it was $65 million a year. We're now at $300 million a year of advertising. So I think it has got to a point where we're going to see it changes. Um, I think the, the, the important thing for me is that we see broad reform and not just some tinkering of saying, okay, well, we're going to just ban it for a couple hours here and a couple hours there. My view is that people under 18 should not see gambling advertising. That should, that should be the starting point. And you work backwards from there. And there's a whole bunch of things we can do, ensuring that young people's data isn't being gathered online when they're using social media. Uh, at the at the roundtable that Rory organised earlier in the year, we had some researchers from from Melbourne come and sort of give us an overview of what's happening in advertising to children, to to young people, and platforms like Facebook will have up to 700 tags on an individual young person. And if you sit down and try and write one word, so one words that describe you, you're going to tap out at, I don't know, 50 or 100 to have 700. And they are then using all of that. They know, you know, they know these young people better than they know themselves and then advertising directly to them and customizing the colors. And it, it's, it's quite extraordinary what they can do. So, I think yes, it is a big opportunity for for the cross bench cross bench to really push this. Uh, Labor have had this lower house inquiry into gambling headed up by Peter Murphy. They're due to report back soon. Really interested to see what they recommend. But I think you're going to see the cross bench really pushing for broad reform across the board. Um, and I think you know while we're at it, it, gambling is one thing, but alcohol is another. Young people shouldn't be advertised to when it comes to alcohol. I think there's also a strong argument for for junk food as well. So yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a fun a fun time seeing where that leads. Hi. Oh, sorry. Hello. I did vote for you, and you haven't let me down. Oh, you give me you. hope. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to say that first of all, um, I was the first member in my family to go to university. In my education, my degree was free. I find the greatest driver for social equity in Australia is for there be, to be a free university degree. Mm -hmm. Wealthy parents pay for their children's degrees. People from the, the poorer socioeconomic groups, they can't afford, their parents can't afford to help them. They will come out with a hundred dollar debt, which they're now inflating or CPI indexing at seven percent per year. They can't look forward to that, a burden mm -hmm. on their shoulders the rest of their lives, just like their parents had nothing, they will have nothing. They'll never be able to get a mortgage for a house. Um, their futures are limited. Mm -hmm. Yet largely these were the people that went into the service industries like teaching and hospitals and wanting to make the world a better place. And they keep saying, no, we're not going to have free education, free universal degrees. They say, oh, people will just stay at university all their lives. They won't. Just give a free first degree. Let these people get out of poverty. Let's give them a chance. And I haven't heard anybody really speaking um, in the government about mm -hmm. this. It was in the papers. Mm -hmm. But I'm just horrified about our grandchildren mm -hmm. um, not being able to go to university. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's the inequities in our university system at the moment. And for me, one of the one of the biggest areas of concern is if you look at a whole bunch of degrees, the wealthier your parents are, the more likely you are to finish. And the the poorer, the more likely you are to drop out. Then to have a hex but not have the degree, which you know the whole thing about hex is that you get the degree, which means you can earn a bit more, and then you pay it back over time. But to to drop out, be saddled with debt that is going up and not have the degree to actually pay for it. One of the, I guess, short-term short, short -term things that we've been pushing them on is the, the job-ready graduates system that was brought in, which really isn't working for universities, which made things like arts, you know, double double the price. Young people aren't making their decisions based on, you know, 
they shouldn't have to, what they want to study based on how much it costs. It should be what they are excited about, what they're passionate about. And Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm. Scandinavian countries can not only provide free degrees for all of their residents, but even if you're um, a migrant, mm -hmm. they provide a yeah. free degree for you. Yeah. If Scandinavian countries can do it, why can't we? Because when, so um, I agree with you, what you're saying, I guess the way that I, have have where the, the way I think we we have to what we need to focus on is revenue and that's a conversation that we're not seeing the major parties wanting to even talk about you know we get this surplus and they are so stoked about it you know we could have more of that if we were just willing to tax resources exactly. more to get a better return and then to start to look at some of the the other sort of tax settings across the economy. At the moment, we are 48% of our tax comes from personal income, which I just think is outrageously high to be relying on personal income that much when we've got all of these generous tax breaks that are not necessarily driving productivity. And so for me, the conversation is around revenue. And we've been working a little bit with the Allegra Spender, um, member for Wentworth. Uh, and she's really keen to see tax reform because I think it is something that, you know, it's not sexy. People don't really want to talk about tax reform, but it is so important and neither of the major parties wants to touch it. Uh, and so I'm really hoping that we can have more of a conversation about that leading into the next election to say, yes, we want all these things, NDIS, you know, access to education, better funding for public schools. We need to talk about revenue. Yeah. Um, so health services, they're not exactly the best, as you mentioned earlier. Um, I'm going to give a few examples here because I like talking a lot, um, as I'm sure you know. Um, late last year in September, my little sister, she had to have a pretty important surgery. She had a really quickly growing um, tumor in her saliva gland um, in her neck. Uh, they weren't sure if it was cancer or not. Um, she's 13, which is scary enough for anybody, let alone a young teenager. And like we had to spend a lot of money on like doctor's appointments, getting it all done, just even fuel getting us from like one side of Canberra to the other to go get ultrasounds and x-rays and all of that. Um, and at the time, the public hospital was also full, which meant she had to be taken into the private hospital, even though still being a public hospital patient, which made the waiting time even longer, which once again, pretty important surgery. It was a tumor that was like uh, pulling on the nerves in like on her throat, which made her like unable to move her own mouth. Um, and then once the surgery had been done the wait times at the hospital were hours upon hours upon hours upon hours at the maxillofacial surgery clinic and the wait times in just a and e are also ridiculous like this isn't the like this isn't a problem with like the hospital workers themselves they're trying as hard as they can to get things to run smoothly and quickly i think it's more a problem with like the funding that doctors get and the amount of doctors that we have i mean i went to the doctors also last year because i was coughing up blood and the only doctor i had available like within like two weeks was one that diagnosed me with nothing wrong with me I went to another doctor two weeks later and she was basically appalled at the way I'd been treated at the last doctors, having them say nothing was wrong with me when, you know, I was coughing up blood, which is a clear sign that there's a bit wrong with you. And doctors are meant to help people, not uh -huh. charge absurd amount of money just to ush you out the door 20 minutes later. By 20 minutes, I mean more like four hours with the doctor's uh -huh. waiting terms. Um, also mental health services, they're not particularly good either. Um, I have to go to a psychiatrist. I don't have the money to go to the psychiatrist. My parents don't have the money. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have to go to the public ones like Headspace and Catholic care. They have really, really, really long waiting times, like months and months, like half a year. And in half a year, if your mental health is already bad enough that you have to go to one of these places, it's only going to get worse, a lot worse. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so yeah, I think they all deserve more money in the health services sector. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I agree. It's it's such a big challenge, and I, I think you know across the country, but particularly here in the ACT. And you know, talking to Senate colleagues, they often sort of joke about how good we've got in the ACT. But when you actually start to talk about some of the statistics that we're actually worse than a lot of regional and remote areas in terms of access. Um, they start to get it. It is something we need to in invest in more. The, the health minister is busy doing a review of mental health. Clearly, such a huge need there and, and so many people not actually able to access, one, access the service or afford services they need. And I think particularly for young people coming out of COVID, it's something we need to put a lot more, more time and attention into. And th there's some really big challenges with the with the health system. So, you know, we are, we're, we're pushing them on it. It's something that they've, they've, they've got a few sort of concurrent reviews looking at how can they best strong structure that. As I mentioned, there's money in the budget, but we're, we're really keen to actually see that flow on to, to Canberrans. And, you know, with the recent announcement about uh, Calvary, I guess there's all the, the local, um, uh, commentary on that. For me, the most important thing is that we do not lose a single doctor or specialist. We simply cannot afford to. Um, we 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 need them all, and I, I really, um, you know, hope the government ensures that that doesn't happen um, as as things are handed over. Um, so sexual violence on Australian university campuses is extremely prevalent. Prevalent. Um, and it's an epidemic and it's been going on for a really long time. There's been a lot of surveys into the prevalence of what's happening and in the ACT, particularly at the ANU, sexual assault is three times the national average and sexual harassment is twice the national average, but the ACT government isn't doing anything about it. Um, just wanted to know what your perspective is or if you're willing to engage on this on a national level. Um, because it's affecting everyone, but in particular in the ACT, mm -hmm. it's the worst in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for raising that. Like the, the stats in the ACT are, are awful, really sobering um, as they stand, but when you compare to the national average, like no no good at all. So thanks for raising that. I'm, I'm really happy to chat more about it and, and see what we can potentially do there. You know, the the, the government... Have they finalised their 10-year plan yet? Sort of. Yeah. So they, they're working on the next sort of 10-year plan uh, for, you know, domestic and family violence and includes, you know, all sorts yeah. of things. But I definitely know that that plan and in the women's safety um, budget statement that there was nothing on sexual violence at universities. Yes. So in the Royal Commission as well into institutional responses to uh, child sexual abuse, it was excluded, but people as young as 16 are living in residential colleges uh -huh. on campus, experiencing sexual assault, uh -huh. reporting it to their um, staff within the university and then they're experiencing more trauma they're forced to drop out mm -hmm. it's just requires more national leadership mm -hmm. some sort of independent oversight or uh -huh. accountability mechanism um, which I think the only option would be if it was um, established separately because when it's lumped in to yeah. domestic family and sexual violence it's always a side note or not yeah. included at all yeah okay Are you, if you have to just Hang around after that. I'd love to chat more about that. Cheers. Thank you. Sorry, I'd like to go back a little bit to the question before about health services in the ACT yes. and the government's announcement that they were compulsorily taking over Calvary Hospital. What struck me at the time when I read the announcement and they're saying, well, this would make much more sense to have a Canberra-wide system all under one sort of umbrella. I thought, oh, my God, they're going to turn Calvary into a hospital that's as bad as the Canberra hospital. And apart from losing doctors and specialists, um, the public information that's come out of Canberra Hospital in the last couple of years um, has often been about um, bullying and bad management 
and they've changed sort of CEOs a couple of times. And I guess that one of my reasons for voting for you in the election was because I really wanted a change of perspective that even though it might not be directly part of your role as a senator, but that would somehow be able to represent Canberra people in a different way with an independent voice, mm -hmm. not just have us seen as, oh, Canberra, the Canberra bubble, and they all have it really good there, mm -hmm. um, but also perhaps as a bit of a squeaky wheel in regard to the ACT government, which I think, from my own personal perspective, has been in power for far too long. I think they need a real shake-up. Mm. Um, I'm not happy about a number of issues. I was involved with Western Creek Community Council for a, quite a while, and the results that we had making representations about planning over oh, from, say, 2008 up until 2019 made one feel really strongly that they'll tell you we want, we're listening, we want a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. They'll have the conversation nominally and then they'll go away and do what they wanted to do in the first place. Yeah. And I'm coming to the very reluctant decision that actually next time I might have to vote, let me know, for the Liberal Party. <laughs> because whatever happens... We need a change. Mm. And I certainly put my support behind Fiona Carrick in the last election. Um, either we need more independence, we need some teal candidates. Mm -hmm. But I have the feeling that I'm not alone in mm. feeling like that. Mm. And I'm really grateful for what you've mm. been doing, um, representing not only issues like um, more money for people on job seeker, but also representing some of the specific Canberra issues mm. that maybe don't get articulated as loudly mm. as we would like. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'll touch on a couple of things there. I mean, with the hospital, I, I know as much as you do from the Canberra Times. Uh, we've requested a briefing. I'm keen to learn more about what's happening, what that means for for, for patients, for, for access to to healthcare, for all the doctors and uh, and surgeons. As I mentioned, we can't we we literally can't cannot afford to lose one. Um, so we'll be we'll be following that up. And then yeah, I guess locally, yes, I'm hearing frustrations, and yeah, I commend Fiona for for running. I think. As an independent, you don't have the 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 party sort of machinery behind you, but what you do have is an awareness that you only have your power and you're only in there to vote on behalf of people. And if they don't like it, they're going to get rid of you. So it's a I find it really energizing and and I'm really enjoying it. And yeah, maybe there is an opportunity for for more. You know, local voices to say, well, I, I want to represent my community and genuinely listen um, when it comes to consultation and putting something together. Yeah. But yeah, thank you for saying that. We almost one more. One more question to. Uh, can I take you back to federal taxation? Um, I noticed that um, Ken Henry, of course, is a, a expert on tax yes. reform, and he, he recommends some good stuff. Going back ten years ago with his review, um, and he's strong on resource taxation, so just like you are. Um, but I noticed he said um, he didn't want; he wasn't opposed to the stage three. Not, I'm sure he would structure it differently, but by and large, in principle, he supported it, and that was for a good reason. Like economists think that there are you know, strong efficiency costs and having such a high reliance on that sort of taxation, as, as you mentioned. Um, he wouldn't be happy, though, I think, with just relying on increasing um, taxation on resources. He's also a proponent for higher indirect taxation. Um, is that where you're at too? Would you favour some tweaking of the GST, like broadening or even increasing? <laughs> um, so I went to a, a tax summit 
that Allegra Spender hosted and Ken Henry um, and a whole bunch of other economists were there and they were talking about a whole range of issues. And I think that's when you talk to economists, they're not interested in, oh, okay, well, let's just do this one thing and then move on. They're saying we haven't really touched our tax system for so long that it does need a broad approach. And you know, his review is gathering dust um, still. I think if you look at some of the Nordic countries, they do up their consumption um, taxes. Um, it's it's seemed, you know, as someone who's new to um, Parliament, this is a bit of a tangent, but it, I found it really strange with the interest rate hikes, politicians criticising the Reserve Bank. Like, that's all they can do. Parliament has set the rules that they they lift the the interest rate. There could be a different mechanism. They could lift, you know, the rate of super contributions or GST to to try and curb inflation. So I think there needs to be a broader conversation. Yes, resources for me, some of the low hanging fruit, given we're not getting really anything back. Um, but then looking at GST, it seems so taboo. And I think I think in the Henry review, he was explicitly told not to look at it. Um, for that reason, like politically, it just seems like you can't you can't touch it. But I mean, then there's a host of other really generous tax breaks that a lot of countries don't think are good for their economy, so they don't do it. Um, so certainly, would welcome. Yeah, it seems like you've got a, a sort of interest and knowledge in this. Happy to happy to chat more and, and see what you think. Just this one comment. I mean, um, people my age don't pay much tax, always in my generality, because. It's so generous for retirees, and yet with us ageing, um, perhaps it's a good idea to make retirees pay more tax if it's through the higher GST. Okay. That'll, that'll go down well. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, um, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any anything else? Maybe, maybe sorry, last one here. I'll, I'll chat to you afterwards. Um, I saw you had your hand up earlier. Thank you. I'll be real quick. Um, there hasn't been uh, a big change in Australia's refugee policy since we withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh -huh. um, and obviously I support that. I think that was really great. Um, but we're post COVID increasing immigration more broadly, but we're not really changing our refugee policy in any meaningful way. So I was just wondering what work you're doing in that space and um, what you can see the next few years changing, mm -hmm. if anything, mm -hmm. but yeah. Thanks. Uh, we've, we've had fairly regular catch-ups with um, Minister Giles about immigration. Clearly it's topical. You know, the government has now finally admitted that immigration isn't working. It does need to change. That's a huge project. And I would argue that in that there's, there's an opportunity to be a lot more targeted with immigration and then potentially be more generous with with refugee um, intake and ensure that that program is actually working. You know, currently, we've got so many people, even here in Canberra, who have gone to school here and they hit 18 and they can't do anything. They can't go to TAFE. They can't go to uni. Um, it, it doesn't seem like a good way to be treating people. And so I think there's a really strong case for people who are already in our communities contributing to be able to actually build a life. And it's something that we've been pushing them on. Um, I guess broader reform, we're really interested to see how they how they do it. Our understanding is some of it will take legislative change, um, but it's, I mean, you know, the politics of this is pretty fraught. Um, so we're sort of waiting to see what they, what, what they do with it. Yeah. You wanna? Do you want to wrap up or shall I? Oh, my own yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's eight o'clock. Thank you all so much for, for coming along tonight. Um, if we can give Sophie a round of applause for being the MC. Um, thank you. Um, and thanks to my amazing team for, for putting this, putting this together. Um, really appreciate you all. And, And thank you all. Um, yeah, have a good night. We'll we'll be hanging around 
to, to chat if you want to, but otherwise, um, cheers. Thank you. It's a fact or fiction, and I got questions, and you got answers, and I'm not sure if they even was asking. You are like in my side. I'm not going to be able to do that. 